From its release in 1989, the Game Boy stormed the market and became the portable gaming unit to have. No longer were you confined to your living room if you wanted to enjoy some good old Nintendo gaming. As the years went on, the Game Boy name would persevere, and we'd see the hardware upgraded and replaced with more powerful options, culminating with the Game Boy Advance in 2001. In 2006, Nintendo would license the Game Boy Advance hardware to a US-based company called Visteon, who specialized in automobile entertainment technology. This partnership would result in a portable DVD player that featured the ability to play GBA games, the Visteon Dockable Entertainment System, featuring Game Boy Advance. At the Winter Consumer Electronics Show in 2006, Visteon Corp would announce their partnership with Nintendo to integrate Game Boy Advance hardware into their line of portable DVD players. While this wasn't exactly an uncommon occurrence for Nintendo, this would mark the first time they'd allow someone else to use their tech in a portable device. Up to this point, we'd only seen things like the LodgeNet N64, which was special hardware used to play Nintendo 64 games in hotel rooms. After a small delay, the Visteon Dockable Entertainment System, featuring Game Boy Advance, or as I like to call it, the Visteon, would see release in July of 2006. Right off the bat, this device had a number of challenges stacked against it. First, it was only available to purchase through a couple of different car manufacturers, such as BMW and Nissan. On top of that, it'd run you over $1,200. It's important to realize that by the time this device was announced, the Nintendo DS was already a year and a half into its life cycle. By the time it was released, the DS Lite was already available in most countries. The dockable entertainment system looks like your standard portable DVD player that was fairly common in the mid-2000s. A clamshell design, sleek silver exterior, and an LCD screen. I don't know if it's just me, but all these things tended to look exactly the same. On the right, rear side of the screen, you'll find a cartridge slot along with an input for connecting a link cable for some two-player action. If you're hoping to also play your older Game Boy carts, then you're out of luck. Game Boy and Game Boy Colors won't even fit in the slot. Turn on the unit, hit the input aux button, and whatever Game Boy game you have inserted will boot right away. The built-in screen has three levels of brightness, which can only be increased using the included DVD remote control. The games retain their 3-2 aspect ratio, but leave a bit of the screen empty. More on that in a minute. Included with the device is this bad boy. Um, yeah. I guess this controller looks like kind of a mess, but it's actually fairly usable. It uses an infrared signal to connect wirelessly to the Visteon, so it has to be fairly in line with at least one of the three IR receivers on the unit. It's definitely easy to lose the signal, but then again, this thing wasn't exactly designed for living room play. The D-pad on this controller was clearly inspired by the original Duke Xbox controller, but not quite as extreme. The button layout is actually pretty neat too. It has your general A and B buttons arranged like they are in a Game Boy Advance, while below you have a giant GameCube controller style A button. This allows for thumb rocking between the buttons like you get with, say, an SNES controller going between Y and B. It works great. On the back side, you have your L and R buttons, and these things are pretty much the worst. Because they're so low on the controller, they can be hard for any adult to reach without contorting your hand weirdly. But, you know, to be fair, the L and R buttons were really only easy to use on the first GBA model anyways. The Visteon does house real Game Boy Advance hardware, and as a result, it plays almost exactly like you'd expect from using Nintendo's own Game Boy Player with a GameCube on your HDTV. But the big question on your mind is, how do these games look? Well, long story short, don't expect this to be some super secret best way to play your Game Boy Advance games. The GBA's 240 by 160 resolution is scaled up a bit, but it's blurry and doesn't come close to filling the screen. It's a shame that there's no option to scale further, since the screen's 800 by 480 resolution could have allowed for a perfect 3x scale. So what we're left with is a lot of unused screen real estate. The screen quality itself isn't too bad, with just a little bit of ghosting. If you want to fill the screen just a bit more, hitting the screen button on the unit will stretch the image horizontally. Sure, this butchers the game's intended look, but I'm surprised they didn't take it even further because the DVD mode offers a number of video calibration settings and multiple zoom options. 
Unlike Nintendo's own Game Boy player, there's no options for borders around the image. Now, I've never been a big fan of that kind of thing, but it's surprising because this unit's target audience would probably be annoyed by the amount of unused space. But that's not all. On the side of the unit is a 3.5mm jack that can output both composite and S-video, so you can hook the dockable entertainment system up to the TV for some big screen action. An optional video output cable was sold by Visteon, but the unit that we borrowed didn't include one, so I had to find a workaround for it. Using a variety of cables, I was able to make it work. Connected to a TV, the Visteon only outputs an interlaced signal, which is about what I expected. Without any sort of component video cables available, 480p is impossible, and I guess 240p was too much to wish for. Right away, you'll see the telltale signs of composite video. The rainbowing and dot crawl all over the screen are typical issues of this low-quality video signal on HDTVs, although it's possible that the issues were worsened due to my custom cabling situation. Hooking up S-Video gets you an immediate improvement. I've always felt that the jump from composite to S-Video was pretty huge in terms of video quality, and that's pretty apparent here. The rainbowing is gone, and the dot crawl is at a minimum. This looks surprisingly good, if a bit blurry. Comparing the Visteon's output of composite and S-Video to a Game Boy player using a set of the expensive GameCube component cables and Nintendo's official software yields some interesting results. The GBP is obviously a bit crisper and displays a progressive image, but it's so much darker. I have to admit, this isn't quite the decisive victory I originally thought it was going to be. Connecting the Visteon to a CRT television reveals a much more appropriate experience. The interlaced image looks really good, with even composite looking worlds better. Of course, S-Video is superior, but it can be tough to find a CRT with S-Video on it these days. Since I had it set up, I took a look at how fast the built-in screen really is by comparing it to a CRT. As you can see, there isn't a whole lot of lag between the output and the built-in screen either. What's impressive is that the Game Boy Advance's 3 to 2 aspect ratio is preserved with video output, unlike some other alternatives, like the Super Retro Advance adapter for SNES. Regardless, the Visteon is in no way the best way to play your GBA games on your TV. Homebrew applications like the Game Boy Interface for the GameCube Game Boy Player offer vastly superior experiences by displaying GBA games at a more fitting resolution of 240p and displaying excellent colors. If you're curious about the Game Boy Interface and a bunch of other options for playing these games on your TV, then check out RGB 208 of our RGB Masterclass here on My Life in Gaming. So, okay, yeah, this is all above and beyond what this unit was originally designed for. You're supposed to take it on a trip, play it in your car, and then when you got to your destination, you take it out and plug it into your main TV. So what about the whole portable aspect of this thing? You know, the dockable, part of the dockable entertainment system? This dock was made to be mounted to the roof of your vehicle. Once you lock the Visteon into this thing, it will cause the image on the screen to flip over. Since I don't have a car that this will fit in, let's just pretend and flip this thing over. That works, right? The dock doesn't really offer too many benefits, although it does have a composite input so that you can hook other consoles into it as well. Doing so with an older game console, like the SNES, yields some actually decent results, if you don't mind having the image stretched. You cannot make the screen show what resolution it's displaying, but look at that. It's not interlacing progressive content at all. LCD TVs generally tend to read the 240p resolution of older game consoles as 480i, causing some really nasty side effects. It handles the 240p test suite's drop shadow test like a champ, but it's just too bad that this has to be, you know, upside down to use this feature. The Visteon also included a nice pair of wireless headphones that can be used when it's docked. They're not exactly the most comfortable things ever, but they do sound pretty good, and they can get pretty loud. Finally, when docked, you'll of course be able to charge the battery. The dock feeds off the power of the vehicle, but if you wanted to charge it outside of the dock, then you might run into some issues. Like the video output cable, Visteon also sold a proprietary AC adapter for charging outside of the dock, separately. This adapter tends to be pretty difficult to find these days, but you can engineer your own by using a generic 12 volt, 3000 MA power block and a PSP size connector. Strip off the input end of the power block and connect it to the input. And there you go, a totally portable Game Boy Advance. We want to thank Ross Attack on Twitter for allowing us to take a look at his Visteon dockable entertainment system for this video. 
It's an obscure bit of Game Boy history, and we're glad that we were able to showcase it. The Visteon tends to be pretty rare and expensive these days, which makes sense since there were limited ways to purchase it in the first place. While it offers no real advantages over the multiple ways to play your GBA games, it is a pretty neat footnote to its legacy.